We're following fresh and deadly fighting in Iraq where the government says clashes between its forces and ISIS uh, fighters near the Syrian border now have left at least 17 militants dead. And in northeastern Iraq, ISIS forces launched an attack on a military outpost in the autonomous Kurdish, Kurdistan region, killing two Kurdish soldiers. With ISIS now controlling huge swaths of Iraq, including its second largest city, calls for the ouster of the Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki are growing louder and louder, and some of his most critical support is clearly crumbling. We're covering all angles this hour with our correspondents and our guests, our Chief National Security Correspondent. Jim Schuto begins our coverage. What's the latest, Jim? Well, Wolf, we're going to see the U.S. troop presence in Iraq build up very quickly. The first teams will come from American troops already in Iraq, stationed at the U.S. Embassy there, who will take on this new mission. Other troops from outside Iraq will be sent in, we're told, quote, very, very soon from elsewhere in the region. And now we have Secretary of State John Kerry dispatched to the Middle East to carry out the other part of the administration's strategy, a diplomatic and political push to rescue Iraq from civil war. The first of 300 U.S. troops will soon be on the ground in Iraq, and U.S. airstrikes may follow. A military offensive now in place, Secretary of State John Kerry will travel to the region to launch the diplomatic offensive, with a goal no less than keeping the country together. Officials inside and outside Iraq agreed Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's Shia-dominated government has furthered a deep sectarian divide among Shiites in the south, Sunni Muslims in the West and Kurds in the North, threatening to tear the country apart. We cannot defend Iraqis from themselves. Only if Iraq's leaders begin to show evidence of unity can we help them. Though few see Maliki as an architect of such unity, U.S. officials have been careful not to explicitly call for his ouster. Not so for Iraq's most revered Shia leader, Ayatollah Sistani, who may have sounded the death knell for al-Maliki when he called for an inclusive government without mentioning the prime minister's name. It is also important that winning blocs open dialogue to help form an effective government, largely acceptable to all, in order to surmount past mistakes. Even as violence continues to flare, three candidates are already raising their hand including one familiar to many Americans, Ahmed Chalabi, who lobbied the U.S. to launch the 2003 invasion. The challenge for Iraq now is finding not only a more inclusive prime minister, but also a cabinet and power-sharing formula for the future. There are a lot of sectarian problems in, uh, in Iraq, no question, but not every one of them can be laid at the doorstep of, uh, of Maliki. After its recent elections, Iraq is actually in the midst of forming a new government now. This gives the opportunity for leadership changes. Ambassador Hill and others who've dealt with Prime Minister Maliki closely say pressuring him to leave will require a very difficult, delicate effort. In Baghdad, as in Washington, Wolf, politicians are you know, loath to be told that they're part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution. And this is a problem going forward, a challenge going forward for the administration. So how serious is this possibility that Ahmed Chalabi, many of our viewers will remember him. He was controversial back in 2002, 2003, Bush, pushing the Bush administration to go ahead and invade, get rid of Saddam Hussein. Many of what uh, the thoughts he was then saying turned out to be, shall we say, false. Uh, how serious is the possibility he could emerge as the successor to Nouri al-Maliki? Well, but by a number of accounts, he's one of the leading three. He, he's, he's a possibility in part because he has some respect among the other groups, the Kurds and the, and the Sunnis, something that Maliki does not have. From an American perspective, though, it would be, it'd be an amazing irony, someone who, as you said, he, he underplayed the costs of, of the war in Iraq, he overplayed the risks of weapons of mass destruction, uh, but what, 11 years later to have him to return, return to political life, that would be a pretty amazing prospect. That would be an amazing yeah. comeback indeed, although he has played a significant role all these years, but not clearly as the leader. Stand by, I want to bring you back into this conversation. There there are fast-moving developments, not only in Iraq, and those fast-moving developments, they are clearly overshadowing, uh, overshadowing other crises, including the one in Ukraine. And now the White House is issuing yet another new warning to Russia. Our senior White House correspondent, Jim Acosta, is joining us from the White House. So what's going on in this front, Jim? Well, if the Russia headache is back, White House officials say there is once again mounting evidence of a buildup of Russian troops on the border with eastern Ukraine. Uh, the Kremlin has said those forces are moving in for border security exercises, 
but the White House is not buying that. Earlier today, senior administration officials told reporters Ukraine is confident that Russia is sending tanks and rocket launchers to separatists in eastern Ukraine. In the past, the president has warned Russia further provocations would be met with tough sanctions on whole sectors of its economy. But today, officials said the next step could be more narrow, what they called scalpel sanctions. So I asked incoming White House Press Secretary Jay Carney if the president is giving up on sectoral sanctions. Here's what he had to say. No, sectoral sanctions remain on the table. We've already seen that, um, that this, the sanctions have been put in place so far uh, in a cooperative fashion, again, with our allies in Europe. Uh, has had an impact on the Russian economy and has had an impact in terms of isolating them uh, in the international uh, financial markets. They don't seem to be deterring their behavior, though. Isn't that fair to say? Well, I, uh, I, I'm not... I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's a fair thing to say. I think what we are seeing is... Um, I, I think we're seeing a lot of mixed signals from Russia right now uh, about what their intentions are. Now, one other big development, one day after President Obama announced he's sending military advisors to Iraq, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin had his own phone call with R Iraqi Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki. The readout from the call said Putin had offered his support to the Iraqi government. Of course, it's not lost on administration officials that Putin may once again be trying to assert his influence in a global hotspot where the U.S. is involved. And, Wolf, uh, we should mention that uh, today was Jay Carney's last day at the White House. He's the outgoing press secretary. Josh Ernest, who you saw there, he will be the official White House press secretary starting on Monday, Wolf. All right. Uh, stand by for a moment, Jim. I want to bring Jim Shuto back into this. So is this a situation where Putin, who supports Bashar al-Assad in Damascus, is now going to emerge as a big supporter of Nuri al-Maliki in uh, Baghdad, even though so much of the world, so many people inside Iraq, including officials here in Washington, would like to see Nuri al-Maliki move on? Well, Putin's, Putin's a cagey character, right? You know, he has this phone call today. He expressed his support for Maliki. Of course, he knows that others, the U.S. included, have lost confidence in him. You know, it's hard to know, is that an actual expression of support, or is he looking to maintain influence with Maliki and influence in this debate as they decide, uh, and all the many players decide who the next leader of Iraq is. It's, it's, it's a possibility, but he's, he's always tough to judge. Just as Jim Acosta was saying there, uh, the administration having trouble judging uh, what exactly Russia's intentions are in Ukraine, uh, difficult to judge here as well. Well, let me ask Jim Acosta, do they have a good sense? Jim, over there at the White House, what Putin is up to as far as Iraq is concerned? Very curious, Wolf. I, I just talked to, uh, or tried to talk with a senior administration official about this, asking whether or not this official had any thoughts on Putin having this phone call with Maliki, because obviously it raises all sorts of questions, as we saw with Syria. Uh, you know, the White House has really uh, deemed uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin to be uh, serious proxies, uh, to be uh, Syria's, uh, you know, partners uh, almost uh, in that country. And, uh, and what uh, I heard back from this official is no thoughts at this point yet. They're, they're, they don't want to weigh in. They know obviously that the Russian president is He's, he can talk with any uh, world leader that he wants to, but to come one day after the president announced this uh, somewhat risky military action in Iraq, uh, it, it certainly got a lot of people's attention over here at the White House. It world. certainly does. Jim Acosta, thanks very much. Jim Shudo, you're going to be traveling with the Secretary of State. Thanks to you as well. Still ahead, a nerve-wracking waiting game as a hillside crumbles from underneath a major hospital. We're going live there. Stand by for that. But up next, we'll get the latest on the U.S. plans to send more military advisors to Iraq. The Pentagon Press Secretary, Rear Admiral John Kirby, is here in the Situation Room. We'll Glad discuss. To be with you. Thank you.